pleasant day to everyone. For today's topic, we will be discussing about venipuncture using the evacuated tube system method. You already know that there are different ways in order for us to collect blood samples in the laboratory. We have arterial puncture, capillary puncture, and also venipuncture. The methods in getting blood under venipuncture, we have the syringe method, the evacuated tube system, and also the butterfly system. For this lecture, let's focus more on the evacuated tube system method. As a medical technologist that is trained to do phlebotomy, we all know that the primary duty of phlebotomists is to collect blood specimens for laboratory testing. A phlebotomist or a medical technologist must be familiar with all the types of equipment in order to select appropriate collection devices for the type and condition of the patient's vein and the type and amount of specimen required for the test. Choosing the appropriate tools and using them correctly helps assure the safe collection of high-quality blood specimens. Venipuncture is the process of collecting or drawing blood from a vein and the most common way to collect blood specimens for laboratory testing. It is the most frequent procedure performed by a phlebotomist and the most important step in this procedure is patient identification. Let's not forget the different equipments and supplies that should be prepared before performing the venipuncture for every blood extraction gloves should be worn at all times make sure that it should be one pair of gloves per patient and remove every after patient the pen is usually the most disregarded supply in the laboratory but remember class that the pen will always be an important material a medical technologist must own. This will help avoid and lessen the cases of misidentification of specimens and also mislabeling. Let me introduce to you the different components of an evacuated tube system. It is composed of a multi-sampling needle, a tube holder, and an appropriate evacuated tube. The different parts of a multi-sampling needle class includes a rubber sleeve over the needle. So this one is connected to the tube holder, which punctures the evacuated tube later on during blood extraction. The threaded hub serves as a stop or lock that keeps the needle and the tube holder in place. Sometimes glass, a threaded hub, has a transparent center that shows you a filled blood whenever you puncture the right vein during extraction. We call this type of multi-sampling needle as a flashback. The shaft is the body of the needle, while the bevel is the pointed edge of the needle, which is used to insert from the skin going to the vein. Once the multi-sample needle is attached to the tube holder, the tube holder serves as the in-house, or this is where the evacuated tube is contained and inserted. So the rubber sleeve of the multi-sampling needle punctures the evacuated tube. Thus, this is how an assembled evacuated tube system looks like. There are actually a lot of multi-sampling needles available and sold now in the market. It is already in a color-coded scheme. So each color is assigned to a certain needle gauge. However, it is still the manufacturer's discretion as to 
what color is for a certain type of needle size. In the principle of needles class, the higher the number, the smaller the inner diameter of the bore of the needle. So, gauges 15 to 17, that means those are big needles. While 23 for butterfly, it is used for infants and children. For the multi-sampling needles class, we use a gauge of 20 to 22. But the standard, the commonly used gauge in the laboratory is gauge 21. Let's now talk about the order of draw when using evacuated tube system. Just remember this code. The traditional code for ETS is stop, light, red, green, light, go. The stop in the code class refers to sterile tubes. So even if it's for ETS or syringe method or butterfly method, the sterile tubes must come first. Sterile tubes will be sent to the microbiology department for culture. Next is the light blue citrated tubes. So this is for coagulation studies. This is also to prevent intermixing of other anticoagulants which can cause increase or decrease coagulation time and lesser um, contamination with the tissue fluid. That's why this goes next after the sterile tubes. Light blue top tubes or the citrated tubes must be inverted three to four times. Next in line is the red top tube for chemistry. It's either no anticoagulant in it or there's a clot activator in the tube. So this goes to chemistry. If red top tubes are not used, you can also use gold top tubes with gel serum separator. After the red top tube, we have the green top tube containing heparin. This is usually used for ammonia test, which is sent to chemistry department. This tube must be inverted eight times. After which is the EDTA lavender top tube. So this goes to the hematology section and is also used for hemoglobin A1C. This must be inverted eight times. Another tube that contains ethylene diamine tetraacetic acid is the pink top tube. This is used for blood group piping and cross-matching. This also is inverted eight times. And lastly, for the traditional code, the stop light red, green light go, go stands for the gray top tube for glucose determination. This contains potassium oxalate or sodium fluoride as an anticoagulant and must be inverted eight times as well. Aside from the traditional stoplight red green light go, we also have another order of draw acronym. It goes in this way. Boys love ravishing girls like dieters love Greek yogurt. Since now you are already knowledgeable when it comes to the different parts of the evacuated tube system and its components, we will now deal with the different procedures. In order for any blood collection procedure to become legal, 
it should start with a test request. This is the first step for the laboratory in the pre-analytical or the before analysis phase or the pre-examination phase of the testing process. Typically, a physician or other qualified healthcare professional requests laboratory testing. The exceptions are certain rapid tests that can be purchased and performed at home by consumers and blood specimens requested by law enforcement officials that are used for evidence. Some states have legalized direct access testing in which patients are allowed to order some of their own blood tests. The blood test, by the way, class that can be purchased and per formed at home includes pregnancy testing, glucose testing, so the one that we use at home, the glucometers. Sometimes we can also purchase cholesterol testing kits as well. So those are few of the tests that can be purchased and performed at home. The very first step in any venipuncture procedure is always the review an accession of the the test requisition class is a form in which test orders are entered test requisitions become part of a patient's medical record and require specific information to ensure that the right patient is tested the physician's orders are met the correct tests are performed at the proper time under the required conditions and the patient is billed properly Requisitions come in manual, handwritten by the doctor, and computer generated for your information. <music> Verbal test requests are sometimes used in emergencies. However, the request is usually documented on standard request forms or entered in the computer by the time the phlebotomist arrives to collect the specimen. Here are some of the required requisition information. The physician's name, the patient's first and last names, including its middle initial, patient's medical record number if the patient is admitted in the hospital, the patient's date of birth and age, not or age, that's and age, room number and bed if that is also admitted, type of test to be performed, the date the test must be performed, billing information, and the codes if the patient is not admitted and is an outpatient. The test status can be timed, fasting, and if there are any special procedures like diet restrictions, latex sensitivity, so those things. There are two types of requisitions, the manual and the computer generated. For manual requisitions class, they come in different styles and types. One type is a three-part form that serves as a request, report, and billing form. But with the increased use of computer systems, the use of manual requisitions is declining. However, they are typically used as a backup when computer systems fail. Computer requisitions, on the other hand, normally contain the actual labels that are placed on the specimen tubes immediately after collection. In addition to patient identification and test status information, many indicate the type of tube needed for the specimen and some indicate additional patient information such as potential bleeder or no venipuncture right arm. So we also do this in the Cebu Doctors University Hospital Laboratory, we already have a computer-generated requisition forms. From there, we just remove the barcodes that are attached to these requisition forms and directly place it on the tube after extraction. Either type of requisition may contain a barcode such as the one that we have in CDUH lab. It's a series of black stripes and white spaces of varying widths that correspond to letters and numbers. The stripes and spaces are grouped together to represent patients' names, identification numbers, or laboratory tests. 
Manual requisitions that have barcodes normally contain copies of the barcode that can be peeled off and placed on the specimens. Computer requisitions typically have the barcode printed on each label. Barcode information can be scanned into a computer using a special light or laser to identify the information represented. Barcode systems allow for fast, accurate processing, and their use has been shown to decrease laboratory errors, especially associated with clerical. A thorough review of the test requisition helps to avoid duplication of orders, ensures that the specimen is collected at the right time and under the proper conditions, and identifies special equipment that may be required. In reviewing a requisition, the phlebotomist must check to see that all required information is present and complete, verify the test to be collected, and time and date of collection. Identify diet restrictions or other special circumstances that must be met prior to collection. Determine test status or collection priority. The definition of accession is the process of recording in the order received. To accession a specimen means to take steps to unmistakably connect the specimen and the accompanying paperwork with a specific individual. When a test request is accessioned, it is assigned a unique number used to identify the specimen and all associated processes and paperwork and connect them to the patient. This helps to ensure prompt and accurate processing from receipt of the order to reporting of test results. Next step is approaching the patient. Being organized and efficient plays a role in a positive and productive collection experience. Before collecting the specimens, the phlebotomist should arrange the requisitions according to priority and review them to see that needed equipment is on the blood collecting tray or cart before proceeding to the patient's room. Outpatients are typically summoned into the drawing area from the waiting room in order of arrival and check-in. As with inpatients, stat requests take priority over all others. Looking for signs containing information concerning the patient is an important part of approach to an inpatient. Signs are typically posted on the door to the patient's room or on the wall beside or behind the head of the patient's bed. Of particular importance to phlebotomists are signs indicating that infection control precautions are to be followed on entering the patient's room. There can also be signs that prohibit the taking of blood pressures or blood draws from a particular arm, especially in cases of diabetic patients or patients undergoing hemodialysis. Other commonly encountered signs may identify limits to the number of visitors allowed in the room at one time. There can also be fall precautions are to be observed for the patient or warn that the patient has a severe allergy, for example, latex or some powdered gloves. A sign with the letters DNR means do not resuscitate or DNAR, do not attempt resuscitation, means that there is an order, also called a no code order stating that the patient should not be revived if he or she stops breathing. A physician, at the request of the patient or the patient's guardian, typically writes the order. For your information, a code is a way to transmit a message normally understood by healthcare personnel. So in the CDOH code system class, we have a code 88 or code 99 for patients that needs to be resuscitated for pediatric patients and adult patients respectively. So now if a warding med tech or a phlebotomist is ready to extract blood from a patient in his or her room, usually rooms class doors are open, but 
It is still best to show some respect by knocking lightly on the door and greet the patient as well as the people inside the room. Make your presence known before proceeding or doing some changes inside the room like opening the curtain so as to protect the patient's privacy and avoid embarrassment. If a physician or a member of the clergy is present inside the room of the patient, never ever interrupt. The patient's time with these individuals is always private and limited. Unless if this procedure is stat, time, or not really of great priority, draw another patient first and then go back to that patient right after. So if the patient has a lot of family members or visitors inside the room, you can ask them to step out of the room when you're doing the extraction. But sometimes, class, there are other family members that will insist in staying inside the room. Allow them. Just allow them to stay inside the room. It is generally acceptable to ask the relatives of the patient to help steady the arm or hold pressure over the site while you label the tubes. There are also instances when the patient is unavailable, cannot be located, or you're unable to obtain the specimen for any other reason. Always fill out a form stating that you are unable to obtain the specimen at the requested time due to some reason. Always also remind or tell the nurse on duty that you are unable to get blood sample so as to avoid problems um, during your working hours. Once you're done identifying the patient correctly by asking the patient positively about their name, so you ask them directly, what is your name, ma'am? What is your birthday? How old are you? And that is the best time already to introduce yourself. So you say your name. So I am Noelin Fontanosa Sidonio. I'm a registered medical technologist and I will be your phlebotomist on duty for today. I'm here to collect a blood sample if it is okay with you. If you are an intern or a student on duty, so let the patient know this and ask permission to do the blood draw. This is part of an informed consent and patient's rights. The patient has a right to refuse to have blood drawn by a student or anyone else. The process of verifying a patient's identity is the most important step in specimen collection. Obtaining a specimen from the wrong patient can have serious, even fatal consequences, especially specimens for type and cross-match prior to blood transfusion. Misidentifying a patient or specimen can be grounds for dismissal of the person responsible and can even lead to a malpractice lawsuit against that person. So it's always best to verify the name, the date of birth, and the age of the patient positively. So you ask them directly. It should not be a yes or no answer. The best way to reconfirm the identification of the patient is through checking their armband or wristband. So if it's a baby, you always ask the nurse on duty if this is the correct baby aside from looking at their ankle band. Okay? If ever there is a discrepancy between the name, the date of birth, and the ID band, and the information on the requisition, the patient's nurse should always be notified. The specimen must not be obtained until the discrepancy is addressed and the patient's identity has been verified. In cases of sleeping patients, you need to wake the patient, but try not to startle them because this can also affect test results. So you have to speak softly but distinctly. If the room is darkened, avoid turning on bright overhead lighting. So wait for the patient to adjust to their eyes and warn the patient first, okay? We also have unconscious patients in the hospital. So when you encounter this, especially in the emergency rooms or intensive care units, if a relative is available, you ask them 
the patient's identification or if not the patient's nurse or physician to identify the patient and record the name of that person correctly. You speak to the patient as if they're awake because they can still hear you. So make sure, class, that you still identify yourself and inform the patient of your intent. Unconscious patients can still hear you. So you have to be respectful to them even though they are unresponsive. There are also instances that we have patients that are young, mentally incompetent. So you ask the patient's nurse, attendant, relative, or the accompanying friend of the patient to identify the patient by name, address, and its birthday. So this information must match the information on the test requisition and the patient's ID band if applicable. As what I have said a while ago, in identifying neonates or other infants, it is always best to check on their ankle bands. So that's found on the lower leg. So they're not placed on the patient's arm, especially for babies under two years of age. So you ask also the nurse on duty, the relative or the guardian regarding the name of the baby, the date of birth, the gender of the baby, the medical record number or any other unique identifier, and of course, the mother's last name or name of person provided at the registration. So approaching the patient, identifying the patient correctly, this time you have to prepare the patient. So by explaining the procedure of the blood test. A statement of your intent to collect a specimen for a blood test is usually sufficient for them to understand what it is about to occur. A patient who has never had a blood test may require a more detailed explanation. Special procedures may require additional information. If a patient does not speak or understand English, you may have to use sign language or other nonverbal means to demonstrate what is to occur. Or... If the patient needs to be explained through the mother tongue or the native language. So you also have to do that. If this fails, an interpreter must be located. Speaking slowly and distinctly, using sign language, hand movements, or writing down information may be necessary for patients with hearing problems. Remember class, in preparing your patients, you have to also address patient inquiries. So you answer all their questions. So you also handle the objections of the patients professionally. There are also patients that are very difficult to handle. So you must always be cheerful and show a pleasant attitude and manner. Because you know, class, hospitalization or illness is typically a stressful situation. So you must always be considerate and understanding to the patient because they might be lonely, scared, or fearful, or just plain disagreeable and may react in a negative manner towards you. Negative reactions personally, okay? We also have patients who have intense fear of needles or needle phobia. So if that happens, you have to raise the legs of the patient while letting them lie down during the procedure. Apply an ice pack to the site for 10 to 15 minutes to numb it before venipuncture. Have only the most experienced and skilled phlebotomist perform the procedure. Sometimes, this usually happens during blood donation class. So, needle, not really necessary needle phobia, but uh, the patient will experience lightheadedness. Good morning, Miss. I am your medical technologist for the day. I am Noe. May I know your complete name? Lovely Queen Conways. And your age? 32. Date of birth? May 17, 1988. Okay, so for your yes. test is CBC and lipid panel. Next is verifying diet restrictions and latex sensitivity of the patient. 
So if the patient's test request emphasizes fasting, so you ask the patient, when was the last time the patient has eaten? For cholesterol tests class with FBS, that's usually 8 to 12 hours fasting time. So it must be within those time range that you can extract blood from the patient. So ask them what time is their last meal of the day or after midnight in some cases. Exposure to latex can trigger life-threatening reactions on those allergic to it. So make sure that the patient has no allergies to Do you have any diet restrictions, Miss? Mm -hmm. uh, when is your last meal? Um, 8 p.m. Okay. Step four is sanitizing the hands. Proper hand hygiene plays a major role in preventing the spread of infection and is an important step in the venipuncture procedure that should not be forgotten or performed poorly. Some phlebotomists, especially me, I prefer to put on gloves immediately after hand sanitation. Others prefer to wait until after vein selection because they find it easier to feel veins without gloves on. But always follow facility protocol. Next is positioning the patient. So for inpatients class, normally they have blood drawn while lying down in their beds. Well, for most outpatients, we have a ergonomic chair or phlebotomy chairs that is available in the blood drawing area so if the chairs are not available the patient should be seated in one that is sturdy and comfortable and has arm rests if a suitable chair is not available or an outpatient is in a weakened condition or known to have fainting tendencies the blood can be drawn with the patient in a reclining chair or lying on a sofa or bed with all blood draws, be prepared to react in case the patient feels faint or loses consciousness. Next is the application of the tourniquet. So that should be done 3 to 4 inches above the intended venipuncture site to restrict the venous blood flow and make the veins more prominent. The tourniquet should be tight enough to slow venous flow without affecting arterial flow. This allows more blood to flow into the area than out. As a result, blood backs up the veins, enlarging them so they are easier to see and distending or stretching them so the walls are thinner and easier to pierce with a needle. A tourniquet that is too tight may prevent arterial blood flow into the area and result in failure to obtain blood. Remember, class, that the preferred venipuncture site is the antecubital area of the arm where a number of veins lie fairly close to the surface. Typically, the most prominent of these are the median cubital, cephalic, and basilic veins in the H pattern and the median, median cephalic, and median basilic veins in the M pattern. Next is grasp one side of the tourniquet in each hand a few inches from the end. This allows sufficient length for fastening the tourniquet and creating the loop. Apply a small amount of tension and maintain it throughout the process. The tension class is needed so the tourniquet will be snug when tied. If too much tension is also applied, it will be too tight and will roll up on itself or twist and can cause discomfort to the patient. Bring the two sides together and grasp them both between the thumb and the forefinger of the right hand. This is preparation for crossing the sides over each other. Reach over the right hand and grasp the right side of the tourniquet between the thumb and forefinger of the left hand and release it from the grip of the right hand. The tourniquet ends will now be held in opposite hands with the sides crossed over each other. Cross the left end over the right end near the left index finger, grasping both sides together between the thumb and forefinger of the left hand close to the patient's arms. If there is too much space between the left index finger and the patient's arm class, the tourniquet will be too loose. That's why you have to really um, secure it 
So while securely grasping both sides, use either the left middle finger or the right index finger to tuck a portion of the left side under the right side and pull it into a loop. The loop allows the tourniquet to be released quickly by a slight tug on the end that the tourniquet ends should point toward the shoulder to prevent them from contaminating the blood collection site. A patient will generally have the most prominent veins in the dominant arm. It should be examined first unless there is a reason that it should not be used. Some veins may be easily visible. Others will have to be located entirely by feel. To locate the vein, palpate, examine by touch or feel, the area by pushing down on the skin with the tip of the index finger. And in addition to locating the veins class, palpating helps determine their patency, size and depth, and the direction of the path they follow. Consequently, even visible veins must be palpated to judge their suitability for venipuncture. To avoid inadvertently puncturing an artery class, never select a vein that overlies or is close to where you can feel a pulse. Step 7 is cleaning the venipuncture site with an antiseptic and allowing it to air dry by itself. Never uh, wipe it with a dry cotton. So the phlebotomist must clean the site with a circular motion starting at the point where you expect to insert the needle and moving outward in ever widening concentric circles until you have cleaned an area approximately 2 to 3 inches in diameter. Use Sufficient pressure to remove surface dirt and debris, but do not rub so vigorously that you abrade the skin, especially in infants and in um, elderly patients whose skin is thin and more delicate. Step 8 is preparing the equipment. So in our case, that is the evacuated tube system and the supplies must be within the reach. So the dry cotton, the bandages must be within reach. So choose the needle size, the tube volume according to the age of the patient, the size and location of the vein, and the amount of blood to be collected. So this is how you correctly place the multi-sampling needle on the tube holder for the preparation of the ETS. Make sure that both ends are tightly closed. So both ends are also needles. The other one is to be attached to the tube holder. So that's the rubber sleeve over the needle. And the other side is the needle that will be used to puncture the skin. Next step is reapplication of the tourniquet. So be careful not to touch the cleaned area. Remove the cover of the needle and visually inspect the needle. So make sure that it should be bevel up. The pointed edge and the bore must be seen visibly on your end. So that means that you're on the correct way of inserting the needle on the patient. At this time, the patient is asked again to make a fist. The non-dominant hand is used to anchor the vein while the collection equipment is held and the needle inserted using the dome. When the needle enters the vein, you will feel a slight give or decrease in resistance. Some phlebotomists describe this as a pop, although it may be described as a feeling and not a sound. It is especially important to recognize the decrease in resistance when using an ETS needle and a tube holder because most needles do not provide visual confirmation that the vein has been entered, except for ETS multi-sampling needles that has a flashback. Remember, class, that a flashback can give you a hint that you have entered the vein correctly because that will fill blood in the containment of that flashback. To establish blood flow when using the ETS system, 
The collection tube must be advanced into the tube holder until the stopper is completely penetrated by the needle. This is accomplished most efficiently by pushing the tube with your thumb while your index and middle fingers straddle and grasp the flanges of the tube holder, pulling back on them slightly to prevent forward motion of the tube holder. If the vein has been successfully entered, blood will begin to flow inside the tube. Release the tourniquet and ask the patient to release the fist as soon as blood flows freely into the first ETS tube. Blood should continue to flow until multiple tubes have been collected. On elderly patients and other patients with fragile veins that might collapse or in other difficult draw situations where release of the tourniquet might be, cause blood flow to stop, the tourniquet is sometimes left on until the last tube is filled. Do not, however, leave the tourniquet on for more than one minute or test results may also be affected. Following the order of draw, place ETS tubes in the holder and advance them onto the needle. ETS tubes fill automatically until the vacuum is exhausted or lost. Maintain needle position while the tubes are still filling. Try not to pull up, press down, or move the needle back and forth or sideways in the vein because these actions can be painful to the patient and sometimes enlarge the hole in the vein, resulting in leakage of blood and hematoma formation. Keep the arm in a downward position so that blood fills ETS tubes from the bottom up and does not contact the needle in the tube holder. Under certain conditions, reflux or the flow of blood from the tube back into the vein and a possible adverse patient reaction from additives can occur if tube blood is in contact with the needle. Additive containing blood on or in the needle could also contaminate subsequent tubes when multiple tubes are collected. Do not change position of the tube or allow back and forth movement of the blood in the tube as this too can cause reflux. A downward arm position also helps maintain blood flow. To ensure a proper ratio of blood to additive, allow ETS tubes to fill until the normal vacuum is exhausted and blood ceases to flow. When blood flow stops, remove the tube using a reverse twist and pulling motion while bracing the thumb or index finger against the flange of the holder. The rubber sleeve will cover the needle and prevent leakage of blood onto the tube holder. If the tube contains an additive, mix it by gently inverting it depending on the type of additive and the manufacturer's recommendation as to how many times of inversion. So, lack of delayed or inadequate mixing can lead to clot formation and necessitate recollection of the specimen. Non-additive tubes do not require mixing. After the last tube has been removed from the holder, fold a clean gauze square into forts and place it directly over the site where the needle enters the skin. Hold the gauze lightly in place but do not press down on it until the needle is Withdraw the needle from the vein in one smooth motion. If the needle safety feature operates outside the vein, activate it immediately while simultaneously applying pressure to the site with your free hand. Apply pressure to the site for 3 to 5 minutes or until the bleeding stops. Failure to apply pressure or applying inadequate pressure can result in leakage of blood and hematoma formation. It is acceptable to have the patient hold pressure while you proceed to label tubes, provided that the patient is fully alert and able to do so. Do not ask the patient to bend the arm up. The arm should be kept extended or even raised. Next step is discarding the collection unit. A needle and tube holder must be promptly discarded in a sharps container as a single unit. Tubes must be labeled in the presence of the patient immediately after blood collection, never before, and the label must be permanently attached to the tube before leaving an inpatient's bedside or dismissing an outpatient. 
If you are using a pre-printed computer or barcode label, you will need to write the date, time, your initials, and other pertinent information on the label immediately before or after attaching it to the tube. If you do not have a pre-printed label, you will have to hand print the required information on the tube yourself. Any handwritten labeling must be done with a permanent ink pen. Labels should include the following information as a minimum. The patient's first and last names, it should be completely spelled out. Patient's identification number, if inpatient, or date of birth, if outpatient, but it should always have a date of birth, whether in or outpatient. Date and time of collection, the phlebotomist name or initials, and pertinent additional information such as fasting or time. Before leaving an inpatient, compare the information on each label tube with the patient's ID band and the requisition. We usually show the label tube to the patient and ask the patient to verify that the correct name is on the tube. Both inpatient and outpatient tubes must then be placed upright in a biohazard specimen bag or other suitable container for transport to the laboratory. The next step is to observe special handling instructions. You always have to follow applicable special handling requirements. Sometimes placing specimens that must be cooled, especially for ammonia, so you place it on crushed ice or in ice container. Put specimens that must be kept at body temperature for cold agglutinin tests. So you place it in a 37 degrees Celsius heat block or other suitable warming device. You can also wrap specimens that require protection from light as for bilirubin testing. So you place an aluminum foil or other light blocking material or place them in a light blocking container. This is to prevent the destruction of bilirubin due to exposure to light. Step 17 is to check the patient's arm once again and applying bandage. So examine the venipuncture site to determine if bleeding has stopped. If you are certain that it has already stopped, apply an adhesive bandage over the site. If the patient is allergic to adhesive bandages, apply paper tape over a clean folded gauze square. If the patient has sensitive skin or is allergic to adhesives, place a folded gauze square over the site and wrap gauze around it. Fastening the gauze with paper tape or wrap the site with a self-adhering gauze-like material such as a coban. Instruct the patient to leave the bandage on for a minimum of 15 minutes, after which it should be removed to avoid irritation. Instruct an outpatient not to carry a purse or other heavy object or lift heavy objects with that arm for a minimum of one hour. Cleanliness is always next to godliness, so make sure to dispose of contaminated materials in the proper biohazard containers or according to facility protocol. Place other materials such as needle caps and wrappers in the trash receptacle. Make sure that you have your tourniquet and that other equipment is returned to the proper place. But sometimes class in the hospital setting, one patient, one tourniquet policy. So the patients, especially admitted patients, they are given a tourniquet. Once you're done, thank the patient for his or her cooperation. This is courteous and lets the patient know that the procedure is complete. Remove your gloves aseptically, discard them in the manner required by your institution, and sanitize your hands before leaving the blood drawing station or the patient's room. Last but not the least, transporting the specimens to the laboratory or designated pickup site in a timely fashion. Prompt delivery to the laboratory protects specimen integrity and is typically achieved by personal delivery, transportation through a pneumatic tube system, the one that you can see in Chonghua Hospital. 
there's a pneumatic tube there as well as in Vicente Soto Memorial Medical Center. They also own a pneumatic tube system or a range picked up by a courier service. The phlebotomist is typically responsible for verifying and documenting collection by computer entry or manual entry in a logbook. That is all for our lecture for today. Thank you so much for listening. Please don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and click the notification button so that you will be prompted for new videos. God bless us all and keep safe. See you soon. Morning life music .io.